All right, good evening, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody this evening to Grace Life Bible Church. My name is Brian Ross. I'm the pastor here uh, at the assembly. It's nice to see a fairly sizable crowd out for the first night of the conference. Our church every fall uh, historically has hosted a Bible conference, and uh, we're glad that you have chosen to come out and be a part of it with us. Before I get rolling with my first message, I just kind of want to address a couple of housekeeping issues. We want to welcome those of you who might be joining us right now on our live stream. We appreciate you tuning in or anybody who might be watching this after the fact. So since we have a lot of visitors, I just want to give a couple sort of directional points. Out of those doors is the fellowship hall, and you'll find coffee and cake and snacks and, and cheese and crackers, etc. Off this room to the left, there is a single occupancy uh, restroom for both the men and the women. And then down this hall, uh, there's a, down the hall to the right, there's a full set of bathrooms uh, should you need to use the bathroom. Um, you can feel free to bring any of your uh, refreshments into this room with you if you want to. We just ask that you, you know, be uh, careful about that if you would. And we're really excited about the conference. Out there on the table, there are also programs or little sheets that uh, give the outline of the weekend, the topics, the schedule, and the speaker, and what they're going to be talking about in any given session. For those of you that are joining us online, what we're planning to do with the live stream is stream this in one, in segments per sermon. So I've noticed some conferences recently, like going with like an even, a whole evening block of like maybe two and a half hours and then a morning block of three hours or something like that. We're going to try to go message by message to keep everything broke up. So when this message is over, when this session is over, we're going to take a break here in the building and then within 15 minutes, we'll be back live again with the next message. The program and times, there are built-in 15-minute um, breaks between each message. We're not going to do a lot of singing this evening or tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow evening after Matt's study, we're going to have uh, a sing-along with our, our church musicians. And then we'll have uh, our normal Sunday morning service with songs, etc. then. So we're going to keep to the schedule. We're going to stay on time, hopefully, and on topic, and we're going to be just working our way through this material. Um, our speakers this weekend are Brother Dave Reed from Columbus Bible Church from the state down south. Okay, he won't mention Michigan all weekend. Okay, you'll notice that. It's uh, one of his uh, major heresies. But um, anyway, and then we have Matt Hawley, also from the state down south, and so uh, we're glad to have both of them with us. And we, a lot of thought and time went into this um, schedule and program, both me conversing with the two speakers as well as our board here kind of going over this with a fine-tooth comb of what we wanted said, what we didn't want said, those, those sorts of things. So we're excited about the, um, the schedule. I think that's pretty much all that I have to say regarding just sort of a general overview. Um, to get us started, and now I'm going to just sort of pivot to the preaching, okay? So to get started this evening, I gave myself the topic of nationalism versus globalism, the great struggle of our time. If you would, get two passages in your Bible. Get 1 Timothy chapter 2 in one hand and get 1 Chronicles chapter 12 in the other. 1 Timothy chapter 2 in one hand, and 1 Chronicles chapter 12. And we will eventually be getting to uh, the, the Chronicles passage, but I have a few things to say by way of introduction. What I'm going to say here kind of is an introduction both for the whole weekend as well as for my message specifically. And we got the theme out of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So if you would look at that, I want to read verses 1 and 2 and have a word of prayer as we begin. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all goodliness and all godliness and honesty. Lord, thanks again for this day. Thank you for this weekend of meetings that we're going to be having here and for the different topics and subject matter that we're going to be trying to cover. We pray as we do, and as we maybe possibly talk about some topics that are maybe uh, hard to discuss and, and know exactly what to say about them, that we can have clarity and understanding from your word. 
and that the saints will be edified and encouraged from having come out. We're grateful for the visitors that we have with us this evening, and we pray that the whole rest of the weekend will be a time of encouragement from the Scriptures. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The idea for the conference came from this verse, verse 2, where Paul says there in the second half of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Um, we were having a men's meeting here at the church. Uh, we were down at the, the road here for the men's breakfast, and we were talking about some things a few months back during the summer, and then that kind of spilled over into the board meeting, just about stuff that is going on. I don't know about you, but I've been asked a lot of questions by people, both here in the assembly and people who may listen or be a part of the ministry remotely, about what I think about different things that are going on. That's always a dangerous thing, right? Because it doesn't really matter necessarily what I think. What matters is what does God say about it. And so you, you, you try to answer things with a, 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 a level of measuredness, I suppose. And so, but, you know, just, I'm just going to run through a list of things that I think people have consternation about, okay? I think there's a fundamental uncertainty and uneasiness that, is, that people are feeling. There's a sort of looming darkness even in the way people are thinking about life and approaching things, or at least I've observed this, i felt this myself. Uh, a while back in a sermon here at the church, I said it's like an inky blackness. It just sort of is there and it gets all over everything, Okay. And there's some things that people are, have uneasiness and uncertainty about, okay? Here's my list. COVID. What happened with George Floyd? The election. January 6th. The war in the Ukraine. The war in Israel. Who's telling the truth about basically anything in, in our day? And so people have, these are some of the questions, like, what is going on? Right? Just what, what is going on? What is true? How do we know who we should believe? Who's telling the truth? How can we make any sense out of this situation that we find ourselves in as believers? Does the Word of God offer us any insight into what is happening in our nation? Okay? Now, I believe that it does. And now flip with me, if you would, to the Chronicles passage, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. There's an interesting verse here that I've been thinking on for a number of years. And I don't claim to have everything figured out about what this verse means but I do want to bring it up here at the beginning of the message. Historically, preaching has provided people with a lens to try to analyze and understand and explain the world through the prism of Scripture, okay? And that has historically been the case. The problem with that often is that it is often a non-dispensational understanding an unrightly divided understanding, and so some of the things that are being said are ultimately possibly wrong, if not unhelpful. And so there's a verse here. Look at First Chronicles chapter 12. Look at verse 32. I find this first half of the verse interesting. Notice it says, And the children of Issachar, notice, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. So that's an interesting verse. It, it, it says that there were some men in Israel that had understanding of what was going on, and out of the understanding that they had, they were able to advise Israel in what they should do, which way they should go, and what they should think. Now, I don't claim to be a wise sage that can do this with any level of uh, you know, infallibility, but I do think the Scriptures allow us a way to sort of evaluate things that are going on in the world around us. Just look what has happened in the last 10 days or two weeks since what has broken out in Israel. All manner of stuff is being said in the Christian world and in the Christian space by prophecy preachers, by Zionists, by all sorts of different stripes of denominational understandings about all sorts of things related to that, that they all can't be right, okay? And you know that, right? They all can't be true. They all can't be right. And so is there, uh, is there any understanding that the Word of God rightly divided can bring to the times in which we live to cause us to think better about what we're seeing and what we're dealing with as members of the church, the body of Christ? Societies, it seems to me, around the world are what I would call re-traditionalizing. There's a, there's a break that is happening worldwide from, you know, one-size-fits-all Western globalism. There's a returning that is happening, it seems to me, to custom culture and tradition and a rejecting of a one-size-fits-all approach to 
life and doing things that has typified Western globalism since World War II. Meanwhile, the globalists are not, they're not, they're aware this is happening and are they, they're not going to sit back and just let this happen where they're just going to relinquish their power and thus we have our, in my mind, our current politics. And it seems to me that the, the core of the struggle of what is going on is fundamentally a struggle between globalism and nationalism between people that want to maintain or approach the world from a globalist mindset versus those people who want to approach the world from a nationalist mindset, okay? And what I want to do this morning, see, I'm used to teaching in the morning. What I want to do this evening is look at this from the point of view of Scripture. Come with me to Galatians 6. Come with me over to Galatians chapter 6. There's three points I want to cover with you this evening. The first one is nationalism, God's answer to globalism. The second point is globalism, the goal of the course of this world. And then I want to end by talking about the idea of the night being far spent. Okay, so again, my three points are nationalism, God's answer to globalism, globalism, the goal of the course of this world, and the idea of the night being far spent. So when you get to Genesis chapter 6, you're going to encounter the story of Noah and the ark. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took unto, took unto them wives all which they had. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he that is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Verse 4, And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare them children, and the same became mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. Okay? Now, this is before the flood. Before the flood, all that existed was, the hum was humanity in general, the human race. There is no nation of Israel. There, is no, there are no nations per se. All you have is the mass of humanity that has reproduced, etc., from Adam. And they are all there, and there, there's no real divisions besides possibly families and stuff like that. So before the flood, all that existed was humanity in a general sense. Okay. Now, God sees the wickedness of the situation. Look at verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he made man in the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So because of the wickedness of man, God looks at the situation and he decides that he is going to destroy the earth through a flood, and that he is going to save Noah and his family alone, okay? Now I think there are issues here that we need to... Uh, just touch on. I don't want to get lost in the weeds on this. Look at verse 8. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, notice, and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Why did God choose Noah to be the one through whom he would save humanity, if you will? The reason he chose Noah is because Noah was uncorrupted in his generations. And if you go back earlier in the passage about the sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of men and there being now a race of giants in the earth, when God looks at this situation, he sees one man and his family that is uncorrupted by this, and so he is going to use Noah and his family to be the one through which he will, you know, uh, alter the situation and the circumstances. Just briefly, I believe that what the adversary was trying to accomplish through the intermarrying of the daughters of men with angels here, I think the sons of God are angels, was a corruption of the seed line through which the Redeemer would come. Because in Genesis chapter 3.15, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, right? And so it's an attempt of the adversary to corrupt or pollute the seed line to prevent the eventual coming of the Redeemer, and so when God looks at it, he sees one man and his family that are pure in their generation. So he decides that he is going to use time to do it. But if you read chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, you'll read all the details about the flood. I want you to go to chapter 9. I want you to go to chapter 9. Now, this is after the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Okay? And the fear, so 
this is after the flood. The, the rest of humanity has been destroyed. The only people that are still alive are Noah and his sons. And God, te- God gives Noah directions here in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, that he's to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is very similar to what God told Adam to do. Flip back to Genesis chapter 1 and look quickly. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, and God blessed them. That would be Adam and Eve. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So after the flood, go back to Genesis chapter 9, God gives Noah a very similar instruction to what he gave Adam originally in Genesis chapter 1, okay? And then God does some things here to facilitate. So notice what, what is it that God wants him to do? He wants him to be, number one, be fruitful, number two, multiply, and number three, what? Replenish the earth. So look at verse two. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Okay? Now hang on a minute. Hasn't he just spent like 40 days and 40 nights in an ark full of animals? Right? And now it's after the fact, and now all of a sudden the animals are going to be now afraid of Noah. Okay? Well, why would that happen? Verse two. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even the green herb have I given you all things. Now here's what I think. You can tell me if you agree with it or not. Spreading through the earth in fulfillment of the instruction to be fruitful and multiply and do what? Replenish the earth. So some of you guys hunt. I would never schedule a conference for hunting season, okay? I know we would not have anybody here, all right? We just wouldn't do that. That would be nonsensical. But if you're going to go hunting, you have to trick the animal, right? I mean, you're hunting for a deer. You've got to get a blind. You've got to hide from the deer. You've got to get like a bunch of doe urine and like spread it all over yourself so that they don't know you're there, right? You've got to do all this stuff to try to trick the deer so that you can shoot the deer. Why? Because the deer's afraid of you, right? Now imagine now, mankind, after the flood, are they going to have to literally run down their food? And as they run down their food, is this going to facilitate a spreading out over the face of the earth, which is exactly what he commanded them to do. Verse 4, he's going to add another thing here. But, but, flesh, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, uh, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require and the hands of every beast will I require, and at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, and in the image of God made he man. Another thing that God does after the flood is he institutes human government. He institutes man's rule over other men, and the ability of men to punish evildoers in a society who have stepped outside of the bounds. According to my understanding of the scripture, I find nothing about that until Genesis chapter 9 after the flood. So God is making some changes to the way that he is going to deal with humanity here after the flood. And then he, so the instruction's pretty clear. What is man to do? He's to be fruitful and multiply and replenish fill the earth. That's what he's instructed to do. God institutes human government to facilitate this, as well as putting a fear of, of, of uh, man into the animals. Come to Genesis chapter 11. Come to Genesis chapter 11. Verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Okay, so this is after the flood. God has given the covenant to Noah. The, the, he's put the, the bow in the sky there to promise that he will never flood, uh, destroy the earth again through a flood. He's given charges and instructions to Noah. Noah is to be, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He's supposed to, to do this. And now we find in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, a very distant the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they said, we shouldn't dwell here because we need to refill the earth. Is that what yours says? It's not what mine says, right? And they said, and, and they dwelt there. So all of humanity is of one language and of one speech. God's given clear instructions to refill the earth, to replenish the earth. And now they come to this place and they find a spot that looks really good and they say, you know what? We should just do what? Stay here. Okay? 
Verse 3, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let, now here's the important part, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. What is the next word in that verse? Lest. Lest we be what? Scattered. Did they know what God's instructions were? God's instructions were to scatter and fill the earth, and they are now acting in direct rebellion against God's instructions. God's instructions were not for them to pick a place that they liked and stay there. No, they know what they're doing. They know it is an act of rebellion against God. Look at verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This is an act of total human, human rebellion against God to do this. They know what God said. They know what God told them to do. And they're choosing to do the opposite. And they're making now a monument here in Babel to their rebellion by building a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. This is all about who? Them. It's not about them obeying God. It's about them glorifying man and their own achievements, and their own ability, etc., okay? So the actions, their actions in building a city and a tower were done in rebellion to God's post-flood instructions to replenish the earth. They did not want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That they didn't, so they don't want that, and so now they act in rebellion. So the adversaries, here's the point I want you to see. Their adversaries' response to God's post-flood command. They are not supposed to be doing this. God told them not to do this, and now we find man doing exactly what God told them not to do by building a city and a tower. They're all of one language and of one speech, verse 1, lest they be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This is an act of rebellion against God's instructions to them, and the adversary's response to the post-flood instructions is to counter what God wanted by establishing a, a mindset of globalism in these people. Okay, look at verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is what? One. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So does God look at the situation and does he approve? No, he does not approve. He understands the rebellion that is in their hearts and he does not approve of it. And he says there in verse 6, let's look at it again. Notice, and they all have one language. So is there any communication barrier? There's no communication barrier. And notice the result and this they begin to do, and now, so they've done this thing here, notice, notice the progression, and now nothing will be restrained from them. So if they did this, and they worked together, and they did this, can they do a whole lot more that's going to be worse than this? So what's the solution in God's mind? Verse 7, go to let us go down there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So what is God's solution? What's his solution? His solution is to confound their language so that now they cannot what? Understand each other. Now you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been in a bilingual situation, but is there not language barriers that permit communication? If you can't communicate, it's hard to cooperate Verse 7, go to, let us go down there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now look at verse 8. So the Lord, what did he do? Scattered them abroad. So he doesn't just confound the language. He also does what? He scatters them abroad. And the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. 
Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So God's response here to the globalism of Babel is twofold. Number one, confound their language, and number two, scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Okay, So in scattering them abroad upon the face of the earth, God is going to institute nationalism as a way for men to be ordered in the earth after the flood and after Babel. Now come back with me to chapter 10 of the book of Genesis. Now you're going to have to put your thinking cap on here just a little bit. Okay? What chapter does God confound their language in? 11. 10 comes before 11, right? I mean, if you can count, does 10 come before 11? So 10 is going to tell you some stuff about what God did that actually in time, in my opinion, happened after chapter 11, okay? So don't get confused, and I'll try to explain that as we go through. But look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were... Uh, were sons born after the flood, okay? Uh, So notice that, uh, go to verse 5, go to verse 5 for the sake of time, skip to verse 5, and then notice what it says, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided. Now watch, number one, in their lands. Everyone after his what? Tongue. After their families... In their what? Nations. Now think through it. Think it through. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, all the earth was of one language and of one speech, right? But now in chapter 10, we're reading about how God divided men in the earth. He divided the isles of the Gentiles. And one of the categories that he divided them into was based on what? Language, right? So this division of men on the basis of language is obviously happening after Babel as part of God's mechanism to scatter them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Hopefully you're following that, okay? So God is going to divide the Gentiles in the earth according to basically four things. Lands, tongues, families, and nations. All right? Look at chapter 10, verse 20. Look at chapter 10, verse 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families after their tongues, in their countries, and in their what? Now, who is dividing men in... Now, understand, this has nothing to do with races. You will read that and you will not find a single word in there about races. This has to do with nations. God is establishing national structures. Now, in, in, in my world history class, we teach a unit on nationalism, and we have this little pie chart thing about the six different components of nationalism. In order to have a nation, number one, do you have to have a land or a territory? Shake your head, yes. Do you have to have a language? Do you have to have a culture? Do you have to have a history? You typically have to have some sort of shared religion. And there's six different things that, that make a modern nation state, right? Well, isn't it fascinating that four of them are right here in the Word of God? What are they? They are lands, tongues, families, and what? Nations. Okay? Chapter 10, verse 20 again. Uh, And these are the sons of Ham after their families. i got to get moving. After their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Verse 31. Look at verse 31. And these are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their what? Nations. And then look at verse 32. Look with me at verse 32. These are, the nation, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth. Where? When? After what? So does God Almighty divide men in the earth into national structures? And these national structures, they have a land, they have a language, They have generations, they have families, and they are divided into the earth into this fashion. This is God's answer to what man was trying to accomplish in an act of rebellion against God in Genesis chapter 11 when he built himself a city and a tower lest he be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
So the heart of rebel, man's heart of rebellion has always been to do it the opposite of the way God wanted it done. Come over to quickly Acts 17. Quickly come over to Acts 17. Acts 17. <clears throat> Look with me at, this is Paul on Mars Hill. Look with me at verse 26. Acts 17, verse 26. This is Paul preaching on Mars Hill. Notice what he says in verse 26. Talking about, um, talking about God, look at verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Okay, verse 25. Neither is worshiped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Here, now watch verse 26. And hath made of one blood all what? Nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Okay, and hath determined the times before appointed. How's that verse end? And the bounds of their what? Habitation. In order for you to have a nation, you have to have a land. And in order for you to have a land, there has to be boundaries. There has to be boundaries that demarcate our land from your land, our nation from what? Your nation, right? And there's going to be these things. And God did it this way. Verse 26, again, he of one blood, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God set it up this way. We just read about it in Genesis 10 and 11. Why did he do it? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord. If haply, that word, notice that's not happily, that's haply. You know what haply means? You're sort of fumbling around out here, right? You're sort of, you're, you're not doing things really well. If happily they might feel after him, the word feel there is the idea of the, like groping around in the dark. By the way, have the Gentiles already said at this point that they didn't want God? And that God turned them over to a reprobate mind, okay? And so God divided men in the earth in, nation, in national structures in verse 27, for a reason that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far away from every one of us. Part of the reason God did this is to provide a mechanism in the earth for on the off chance that a Gentile might actually seek after God, they would have the ability to what? Find him. Okay? So, God divides men in the earth into nations. Genesis 10, Genesis 11. He does this in direct response to man's rebellion, okay? And then what does God do? He goes and he forms his own what? Nation. Is he going to now call out from among the nations, plural, a nation unto himself through the nation of Israel? Come to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, <clears throat> look at verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will what? So if God's going to make a nation, does he have to give the nation a land? Why has he got to do that? Did he, get, did he do that with all the other nations? So now God's going to form a nation, and he's going to give the nation a land. He's going to give them a territory, okay? And notice verse 2, and I will make of thee a great what? So this is the nation of God's own forming. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all what? Shall all nations of the earth be what? So has God before this has he already established nations? Now, out of that multitude of nations, does he pull out one man, Abraham? Does he set him apart? And is he going to make a nation out of Abraham? Okay. Now, we don't have time to read all the verses here because I just, um, there's all, go, go, do, let's do turn though to Deuteronomy 4. 
So do turn to Deuteronomy 4. God gives them a territory. We, we, there's, there's, multi, there's scores of verses we could read, okay? You know that God gives them a land. He gives them a territory. You know that they're eventually going to be divided into 12 tribes. You know that they're going to function as a nation the way God uh, established nations to function. And the whole point of God forming this nation is that this nation would be distinct. They would be his nation. They would be a testimony and a witness to the other nations, all right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. Keep therefore and do them. So he's talking about the law. In the context here, it's Israel entering into the law, keeping the law in the land. Talking about the the, the commandments and statutes and judgments, verse 6. Keep therefore and do them. Now watch, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of who? The nations. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So God makes his own nation, puts them in a land, gives them his law, gives them his statutes, so that they can be a testimony and a witness to the other what? Nations. Which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7, for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments as all this law which I set before you this day? See, God is doing something with the establishment of nations in the earth that is going to be for an orderly witness and an orderly testimony to where God is and what God is doing. Israel in the land keeping the law Other nations were supposed to see that, they were supposed to observe that, and they were supposed to want and come to God through who? Israel. That was the plan, right? So now what does Satan do? He attacks God's nation to get them to live and function and operate just like the other what? Nations. Because if he can get them to do that, what happens to the testimony that this nation was intended to serve to the other nations? It goes away. Go with me quickly to Revelation 19. I know we're skipping a lot of stuff, but go over to Revelation 19 quickly because i got to get to my second point. Revelation chapter 19. There is coming a day when... Jesus Christ is going to rule the what? The nations. And he is going to rule them with a rod of what? Iron. Revelation 19, look at verse 15. In verse 11, we see the second coming. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. For the sake of time, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite who? The nations. And that he should rule them, the nations, i.e., with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. What I want you to see is that God established nationalism as the way and the mechanism through which he was going to deal with men in the earth. Okay? Brings me to my second point then, globalism the goal of the course of this world. The adversary, Satan, who is the enemy of God, who is charting a course in the world to oppose God, does he want to weaken the nations? Does he want to make, does he want to do away with the national structures that God established ultimately culminating in a globalist system with the wrong guy leading it. Okay? Go to Isaiah 14. I've been thinking about this verse a lot. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Now, I'm going to say some stuff here, and I want you to think about what I'm going to say, not through the lens of partisan politics, but through the lens of the Word of God. Now, that's hard to do, I know, but I'm going to ask, it's a, it's a, it's a hard ask, okay? But look at, look at Isaiah 14, look at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Who's that? 
That's Satan, right? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son? Now watch, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground? What's the last clause of that verse? Which didst weaken the what? What has the adversary been endeavoring to do ever since God Almighty established nationalism? He has been endeavoring to weaken the what? The nations. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. How would you weaken a nation? Well, you ask that question in modern 21st century America, and you might hear stuff about, well, the monetary policy, the economic policy. This, then people might have all ideas about how to weaken a nation. I want you to think about this for, for a minute in terms of the four things God did in establishing a nation. If Satan is going to weaken the nations... It seems to me, scripturally, he's going to attack the nations according to the mechanisms and structures that God used to establish what? Nations. Well, what were those things? You attack them according to, number one, lands. Obscure national boundaries. Two, tongues. Degrade and devalue a language so that words can be used to say anything one wants. Now, how did, he, how did he establish a nation? According to lands, language, tongues, families, and territories, right? So lands, you'd weaken national boundaries. Two, tongues, you'd degrade and devalue a language so that words could be used to say anything you want. You know, <laughs> what is a recession anyway? I don't know. You tell me. Okay. Families, you would attack and redefine what a family is as one of the, and the foundational structures that support it. A family is based upon a marriage. And a marriage, scripturally, is based upon the union of a man and a woman. Not two women, not two men, but a man and a woman. Okay, and by the way, then you would also have enveloped within that the fundamental understanding of basic human sexuality, that male and female created he them. Marriage is based upon males and females getting married to produce offspring to establish a what? A family. So if you are going to attack a nation, you would attack a nation based on the parameters that God used to establish nations in the beginning. And you would seek to weaken national borders and boundaries. You would seek to devalue and degrade a language. You would seek to attack and redefine what a family is and the basic structures upon which the family is built. Up to and including a basic understanding of what it means to be male-female. Folks, I don't know how much more, I don't know what is more fundamentally basic in all that God did other than making male and female created he them. But now, see, is that very premise up for discussion in our day? Okay? And are you a terrible person if you hold to God's view in the culture? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. So I believe, just to try to make things clear for you, that all the things that we see around us, are in our cultural milieu, if you will, are somehow related to this fundamental struggle between globalism and nationalism. Because Satan has been endeavoring to do this. And man, you know, one thing Satan is really good at is he plays the long game. He plays the long game really well. And that's what we hate as humans, right? I hate the long game. I want what I want, and I want it when. Now, right? I don't want to wait. But look at verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you, Ephi quickened, who were dead in, uh, dead in trespasses and sins... Wherein in time past, so before you were saved, ye walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The, cor- the world is on a course, and the course that the world is on has been charted by the prince, the power of the air. And this is all about his course, what he's charted. It is all about honoring God and doing what God's word says, right? Right? Or is it all about undermining the word of God and undermining what God said and how things should be done? Okay? Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let me just say, Dave's going to talk about this a little bit in a little bit, but what we're talking about here is not so-called Christian nationalism. That's something different. What we're talking about here is biblical nationalism. We're talking about a nationalism that God ordered, that God established in his word before there even was a Christian alive, about how the world would work, and how God would use, how God would work in the world, and how things would go, okay? And ever since God established this, the adversary has been seeking to weaken the nations. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. It's already at work, folks. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of who? So, folks, is the course of this world careening down a path to where the, the, very, the absolute wrong guy is going to be the one that the world looks to to solve their problems? And he is going to be the one that is influenced and animated by the very adversary himself. You following that? So the course of this world and the mystery of iniquity doth already work, verse 10. And with all deceivableness, all deceivableness, he's not going to accomplish this without deceit and deception and lies to fool everybody about what he's doing. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be what? So the course of this world and the mystery of iniquity will culminate, okay, in a one world system, a globalist system that is run by the absolute adversary of God. So the struggle that we are under, in my opinion, trying to be one of those men of Issachar and have some understanding of the time, is a struggle between nationalism and globalism. And I think if you think a little bit about our current politics, you'll probably see that that's true. Go to Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, I have in my notes to start reading at verse 7, but I'm not sure we should do that because, well, I suppose we should. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. So this is, this is the adversary. This is the beast. This is the, the, the enemy of God. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given, over, uh, given him over all kindreds and tongues and what? Is this guy going to rule a one world globalist system? That's what the Bible says, okay? That's what the Bible says. He's going to have power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Isn't that interesting? How did God establish nations? In generations, in tongues, with, through tongues, and in their what? Nations. And this guy is going to have control over all of it according to the word of God. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Sorry, the book of the book of life of the land slain before the foundation of the world, and if any man have an ear, let him hear. Drop down to verse, uh, verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast spoke, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? 
killed. And, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that, they might, that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Is there going to be a globalistic, one world, religious and economic system under this guy who has power over all kindreds, tongues, and nations in the 70th week of Daniel in the time of tribulation? So the, the course of this world is moving towards that as its culmination. And where we are at right now, at, I don't know where we're at as far as when the rapture is going to happen, but let me just be clear about it. I don't believe that you and I need to worry for one second about being here on earth in Revelation 13. Okay, let's just be clear about that. But you need to understand that that's where all this is ultimately going. Okay. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, not knowing when the rapture will happen, I believe the tension that we see is a, a rubbing of nationalist, traditionalist sentiments against those who want to maintain or push forward with a more globalist approach to doing things. And so the result is there's a rub, and you feel the rub, and I feel the rub. First, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus... Christ and our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand okay we need to take comfort in the fact that the body of Christ will not see the full onset of the mystery of iniquity is the mystery of iniquity already working yes. yep Will we be taken out of the way? Will we, sorry, that's the wrong phrase. Will we be raptured and caught away before that full thing is allowed to take its course? And in fact, if you study the passage, I believe that what is holding back the full revelation and manifestation of the, the course of this world and the man of sin and the mystery of iniquity is the presence of the church, the body of Christ, in who is letting and hindering and who is in the way and holding that thing back. But as the days get darker and longer and, the, dis and the, the, the dispensation of grace gets more and more spent, you feel it more possibly. But we will be taken out. We are not appointed to wrath. Go back one page to 1 Thessalonians 5, and I need to start wrapping this up. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll be here tomorrow again in my message, but look at verse 1. But at the times, chapter, the end of chapter 4 is about the catching away of the church. Chapter 5, verse 1, By the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief when? In the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. And as travail upon, travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But now watch the change in the pronouns. But ye, brethren, notice the they and the ye. Those guys are the ones that need to worry about the sun destruction. Verse 4, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, the church, the body of Christ, we don't have to face the wrath of the 70th week. But you need to understand that the course of the world and the mystery of iniquity is it all working towards when it will culminate in that system we just discussed. My third point, the night is far spent. Come to, come to Romans 13. It's a shorter point because I only have six minutes. <clears throat> 
Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far spent. I don't have time to teach all the verses, but remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, he says it's daytime. He said the day is coming when I won't be here and it'll be what? Night. It's been over 2,000 years since he's been here, hasn't it? Paul writing to the Romans in, in, in what I would perceive to be somewhere around Acts 20, he says at that time already that the night is what? How much more spent is the night now nearly 2,000 years later? Much more. There we go. Great technical. Much more far. We'll go with that. I like that. Okay. <laughs> so as the night. So we're children of the day, guys. We just read it. We're not children of the night nor the darkness. We're children of the light and of the day as members of the body of Christ. I f- the 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 consternation that I feel, that possibly you feel, I think is a product of living in the night that's far spent. And understanding that where this is going and what will happen and the forces that we see in play around us as we look out into our current situation. The night was already far spent in Paul's day. How much more spent is it now? Much more waste, whatever he said. Much more waste spent or whatever that was. There you go, that sounds okay. Now look, go to Ephesians, I got two passages and I'll close. Go to Ephesians 6. You need to remember that no matter what happens, we are not fundamentally wrestling and struggling with flesh and blood. Okay? Man, I tell you, I just love the Lord of the Rings because there's so many parallels, but I won't go there because Dave will go home. <laughs> Verse 12, Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against what? Man, we think so often that it's that person, the neighbor, the family member, the other believer, the guy that lives around the corner that just is off in la-la land on whatever it is. You think that that's your enemy, but we're really not wrestling and struggling with these people. We're struggling with principalities and powers, with the rulers of the darkness of this world. There are spiritual entities that are ruling the darkness of this world, Paul says, and that's who we're wrestling with against, spiritual wickedness in high places that are, uh, that are charting a course that are steering things in a certain way, and we as believers are sort of caught in the middle. And no matter what happens, last place, 2 Corinthians 5. Imagine... I'm I'm dead serious about what I'm about to say. Imagine being unsaved. Imagine possibly being saved, but not understanding the word rightly divided and dispensational truth and trying to make sense out of what is happening. I can't can't fathom it. I, I seriously can't fathom it. And what... What the, what the folks need, what the world needs, what people need, is they need to get saved. They need to get saved. And so what the adversary does is he comes along and he moves you and he throws his, shoots his fiery darts at you and he gets you thinking that something else is the main thing other than what's the main thing. And what's the main thing? The main thing is the ministry of reconciliation. The main thing is the fact that people are going to die and suffer eternal punishment if they don't believe and trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sin, was buried and rose again as the only total complete payment for their sin. And so now we who understand, we get off into weeds on stuff. And look, some of it might be important stuff, but it's not the main stuff. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. See, we have a job to do, right? Our job is not to hold back the course of the world. The course of the world is going to work and it's going to do its thing and you're going to sort of be, you'll be swept away with it if you let it. Your job is to be a minister of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, verse 19, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we as ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So as I close, I'll just say this. I do believe that the main issue that we see going on around us is a struggle between nationalism and globalism. I believe that is the ultimate trajectory of the course of this world. I believe the night is way more, far more spent. Let's go with that. Than it was 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote Romans. And I believe that you and I as members of the body of Christ, we are caught in the middle of this. And the rub that we feel is we know that things are not as they should be. But your job and my job is not to fix that. Our job is to be ministers of the word of reconciliation. Lord, thanks for this day and for this time. We're grateful for this um, group of saints that has gathered here this evening to, to hear the, the preaching of the word. We're grateful for those who have joined us online as well. We pray as we continue with the rest of the conference that will be edifying and encouraging. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.